Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a creek and the model number is CAS440. In terms of general specifications, RMS power output is 30 watts per channel and that's two times eight speaker load. It supports switched and unswitched speaker terminals. So just clarification, if you use the headphone socket, when you connect, if you're using the switch terminals on the rear, it will disconnect the speakers. Unswitched, of course, means that if you connect your headphones, then it will not disable the rear speaker terminal. And then in terms of input sensitivity, you can connect directly a turntable with a moving magnet type cartridge. Our miller voltage is 2.5 millivolts at 47 kilo ohms. And then for your other inputs, this is the auxiliary, disc, tuner and tape monitor. It's 250 millivolts. And then if you look at the headphone socket, that's a quarter inch jack. And you also have the mono selection mode as well. And also an HP filter and individual bass, treble and balance controls. Then overall weight is 4.4 kilograms and dimensions for the amplifier height wise is 60 millimeters with a 420 and then the depth of the amplifier comes in at 185. Now this amplifier would be regarded as a classic British amplifier and again many many people still use these amplifiers and you can also pick them up maybe through auction websites at a relatively low cost. Now what was the issue with this amplifier when it came into the workshop? Well as I'm showing you now, what you can see is I've highlighted two of the power supply protection fuses. And these are T, so this is a time delay at 2 amps. Now there's two issues here. The first one, if you look at the arrow, and this is very, very common. With these types of fuse holders, over time you'll find that the end caps don't make a direct connection with the end of the fuses. So if these are the other sets of fuses, again, which are T2 amp, which are used to protect the speaker outputs, you can find that you get intermittent loss of sound and if you just sort of move move the fuse a little bit then it will reconnect so the fix here for that particular one was simply to remove the fuse and you do this for all of the fuse holders in this amplifier just squeeze the ends with a pair of long nose pliers and then you can snap back into place very firmly the fuse one to watch out for and really a common type of fault the second thing that i'm highlighting is I've just drawn a circle around one of the power supply protection fuses and it's blown. So this indicates that the amplifier could have drawn excess current or maybe there was a surge on power up resulting in the fuse failing. When you removed it from the fuse holder and took a closer inspection, you could see that this wasn't something that had been caused just from a power cycle. It was blackened and had vaporized the fuse. So that meant that the amplifier had drawn excess current. So the first point of call is to go and check the output transistor. And what you can see here are the output transistors and there's two types. On the earlier version, which this amplifier is, you had an N910 output device and an N911 device. So at some point in time, the right channel output transistors have been replaced. These output transistors are common on the later series of amplifiers because the N transistors became obsolete. But what was interesting here was First of all, the replacement output transistors were non-matched. So it appeared that they, one of them seemed to be an original type. So this is a Philips type. But then the other one was almost unbranded. And then when you sort of look at the orientation here, there's something wrong. So I can presume that some form of repair work had been carried out. And for whatever reason, the engineer inadvertently had mixed up the positions of the output transistors. So the replacement devices are Philips, but this is a BDT64C, and that is the PNP. The BDT65C is the NPM, but they've been switched around, so they're in the wrong place. So of course, if you powered up the amplifier, that's why it's blowing the power supply protection fuse. And also these output transistors are short circuit because they were incorrectly installed. Now, always remember, if you're doing the repair work, just to use Dimball Test, and I'll put that as a link in the description of the video. So when I replace the fuse, of course, I can power up, and then I could quickly know that the orientation was wrong. So what I've done is I've turned the board over, and it's quite straightforward to remove this. What you have to do is they're just held in place by a plastic pillow. You pull off the front control knobs, and then what you'll be able to do is just turn the amplifier over, and there's three screws, machine screws, just release those. Then the final thing that you have to do, and again, don't use a pair of long nose pliers, just you maybe use a small adjustable spanner, release the locking nut for the headphone socket, and then you can move that out of the way. And then it's very easy just to squeeze in the plastic pillar mounts and then lift up the amplifier board. So 
what you can see here is the underneath of the board and you can quite clearly see that someone's fitted a wire link so I can only assume that when they push through the transistor that it pushed away some of the circuit track remember with this amplifier because it is a very very early device you know probably in from the 70s what you see is that the board is not marked so it doesn't give you a component reference number so I would imagine this is probably how, how the error occurred so what I've done is of course replace the output transistors with the correct type but then I've corrected this issue or this poor solder on the underneath of the board just to bring back you know the integrity of the solder connections what you're now seeing is the left side um, what you can see I've removed the fixing screws and then I've pulled the transistors forward now the first one just on the right hand side it doesn't have a washer so with all transistors normally if they're mounted to a heat sink you'll have this insulating material and this is a mica washer and this mica washer should have heat sink transfer compound between the heat sink the mica washer and then the micro washer and then the output transistor but it's completely dried out so just as a matter of course just to ensure that these transistors are getting the right amount of thermal transfer through so you're not overheating the output devices what I'm doing here is I'm just replacing the heat sink compound onto the mica washers once that had been done it's a straightforward task of course then to refit the fixing screws and as I said one of them will not have a mica washer all of the other transistors do but one does not but that doesn't mean to say that it's missing it's just part of the build and then what I'm showing next is channel has been repaired so I've fitted the two original Philips devices correct orientation and then you've got the correct thermal compound for the transistors and before I've powered up the amplifier I've just checked it through from a component point of view so don't just replace the components and fit new fuses just do some additional checking because the output transistors have failed short there was a possibility that maybe the driver transistors had also failed or there was another underlying issue so it's really a, a systematic approach just to follow through and ensure that everything is good before you apply power now what you see here is an extract from the and it's not a day service manual it's just simply the schematic for this particular version of amplifier and there's a version one a version two and a version three and i've also seen layouts or board designs which don't appear to match directly the circuit diagrams which are available so what i'm highlighting of course is that the transistors were switched around but you can see here that these output transistors are darlington type and this is common we've sort of covered this in other tutorials it simply means that with the darlington transistor it can deliver more output current effectively providing a higher power output and this amplifier the input sockets are not rca the only ones which are are the phono connections but all of the other inputs are using these common five pin din connectors and again very common from this era and the amplifier doesn't support any form of electromechanic or, or relay protection system for the speakers you just have the fuses so you have these t2 amp fuses for the power supply and the same t2 amp fuses for the protection for the output stage and then what i'm showing you here just really a zoom in view and this is the input circuit so you can see the five pin din sockets at the back then on the left hand side you can just about make out one of the plastic pillars which i remarked about earlier and this is where you're connecting the phone nose socket and they've just used an integrated circuit for the phono stage and then what you can also see is all of the different input selection switches now as a matter of course it's very important just to clear those switches now you can't get access to them and sort of strip them down easily but if you spray into the small access hole there the oxid d5 and just really operate those switches multiple times and then you'll find that you know they'll be completely noise free and then here this is the power supply and then also the protection fuses with the fuse holders and you can just sort of make out some of the user control so you can see there that's the balance control the base and the treble and what they use is a common ground connection so this is where they've soldered a wire link connecting all of them together and what you see on some of the amplifiers on the later ones they had a locking nut which is at the front on the metal chassis but this very early version that wasn't the case it simply had a metal washer and then behind you just had a locking nut the design did change over years and then here you can see the toroidal transformer so i think the point to emphasize is if you look at a modern day amplifier you know it's often designed using a cad machine and software to get all the board layout and everything else here you can see that this is everything is hand built 
and you have these wires interconnectors you know big big sort of switches and, and sort of nice to look at i suppose you know whoever the engineers were at the time they were definitely sort of pushing the boundaries of design in order to establish the creek brand you know as a as a brand which would be sought after by the consumer and then here sort of just to sort of close off what you can see is the top of the amplifier and these are with the new output transistors in place and also a cleaning of the board now with this amp there's no bias setting as such so you don't have any user control sort of adjustment trimmers and you're not measuring across emitter resistors they're sort of set or the bias is set by the diode arrangement to turn the transistors on and then finally here you can see these are the transistors which were short circuit as i mentioned previously different brands for some reason and then also the single power supply fuse which had blown so not a complicated repair uh, a little bit of a head scratch i suppose if you sort of come across it for me because i repair these on quite a regular basis as soon as i looked i could see that the uh, transistors were in the wrong position so it's easy enough but you know when you put these amplifiers onto test phase and you've got the speakers connected really a very very impressive sound i do like them i think sometimes working on some of the modern stuff you don't always get the same sort of feeling as you do if you take something like this and then you restore it and bring it back to work in order. So a real pleasure, I would say. So I really appreciate you stopping by. And if you require any support, assistance or guidance, then by all means, email audio amplifier servicing at AOL.com. And I'll be more than happy to come back to you and provide any support or guidance that you may require. So until the next time, I wish you well. Cheers and bye bye.